I'll read a uh, short essay of Gustav's from um, Aura, Last Essays, and uh, then two brief poems written uh, <coughs> um, one towards the end of Gustav's life, uh, the two brief poems of mine, and one quite recently. The Inaudible Aura of Bells. Located in the very heart of the Louveron, alongside an abandoned mountain pass, the priory of Saint-Forion -Saint can be spotted from a remarkable distance thanks to its tall, slender, buff-colored belfry. Indeed, this belfry strikes the visitor today as needlessly elongated, towering as it does in its four-story turret high over the surrounding woodlands. What was the need, one might ask, for such a sprung, seemingly hypertrophic structure? It's only in reading the appropriate documentation that one comes to realize that the bells of saint saint not only rang the hours, both canonical and sidereal, but served, as bells often did throughout Christendom, non-chronological functions. At Saint-Symphorion, for instance, they were known to direct travelers caught in a heavy fog or a blinding winter blizzard on the outlying mountain pass toward the refuge of the monasterium itself. From afar, the bells quite literally told the traveler's way to warmth and shelter within the walls of the sanctuary proper. Church bells, in fact, have long been invested with a broad range of powers, be they functional or mystical, well beyond that of fulfilling their perfunctory mission. In the form of massive cast iron vessels, they first emerged out of the Campania in central Italy and rapidly proliferated throughout the 8th and 9th centuries. From the pontificate of John the 13th, circa 960 onward, they would receive nothing less than the full blessings of a ceremonial baptism, often from the hands of the Pope himself. Each bell wrapped in an alb, a full-length white linen ecclesiastical garment, would undergo immersion in holy water, then, upon being dried, receive unction seven times from without, four times from within, with prescribed oils. To conclude the ceremony, a thoroughfare would then fill the bell jar with the smoke of incense, investing it thereby with the essential propensities of prayer, supplication. Once suspended within their respective belfries, bells would not only toll time, and from matins to vespers beckon the faithful, but endowed with supernatural forces, serve to purify the spirit and repel demons. For the church, in its ongoing struggle against witchcraft and superstition, had conferred upon the bell exorcistical powers. Against the belief, for instance, that thunder and hailstones were provoked by witches, that even the least hailstone contained in its impacted mass a single witch's hair, bells were rung to disperse such maledictions. Indeed, well into the 20th century and within memory of the oldest inhabitants, church bells continued to be rung for such purposes. For that matter, in certain remote regions of the Alpes de Haute Provence, they still are. The tolling of bells was also reputed to protect grain from the moment of its sowing to that of its harvesting. By the faultless fall of their vibratory beats, the bells would awaken the seedlings from the torpor of winter and so stimulate their germination. This would be particularly true in celebrating on the 25th of March each year the Annunciation. For the anniversary of that mystic insemination could only favor in the symbiotic spirit of parishioners the insemination of the fields themselves. Quote, May an everlasting protection hover over the harvests of the faithful as well as over their bodies and souls, unquote. An ecclesiastic would intone in baptizing a new bell. Invested with the power to tease the seedling forth from within while protecting it against demonic forces from without, the church bell, over the centuries, brought solace to the devout on little more than a quaver, 
the sonorous aura of its vibrations. One might well assume that, under the influence of its subtle pulsations, it allowed the long awns and sharp spikelets of an ear of barley to burst into radiant flower every bit as much as it bathed once the deepest recesses of the human heart in the balm of its resonance. That's good. That's good. I can't do that. <laughs> Um, let's see. It's amazingly uh, moving, actually, to put that singular language of Gustav's into your mouth and let it go through you. It's the same with reading the poetry. There's no distinction, really, in that regard. Um, the first of the two poems I'll read is a poem called Say, S-A-Y, and it's the beginning of a sequence um, of what ended up with eight poems. Uh, I had, I got the call from Andrew um, and, uh, was it Eric Sucher, who, who was the co-editor of the Festschrift? Yes. Oh, you were the two. Oh, okay, I couldn't think who was the two. Okay, so, uh, but Eric wasn't part of it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> um, that they were doing the fest shift, and so this poem had just begun sort of with an echo of the voice of Wallace Stevens, just the first couple of lines, and I thought, well, this is obviously the poem, the beginning, if it comes along, of the poem for Gustav for the fest drift. Um, Gustav didn't live to see it published, the, the fest drift, but Andrew Zawaki went down from Paris to read um, the collection of uh, appreciations to him on his deathbed. Um, so, say. And he apparently said, yes, Wallace Stevens comes up in Michael's work occasionally. And he heard the that voice passing between us. Say she is the queen of Bollywood of special seeming, and tell us too that Mr. Speaks is silent, and how the tattoo master, Tuttle, is Caravaggio for our time. Say that the music we heard was a real thing, formed of ebony and earth and unrehearsed, and that it caused the drama on the screen to swell, making the unreal come to be in ways we could only envy. Tell us what we most and least wanted to know of who and what we are beneath right now. And then the second poem for Gustav um, is in a sequence that finishes my new book. Uh, the sequence is uh, of uh, probably be 18 poems, unless another one or two try to get in there. I'm trying to stop the book, but the book doesn't want to stop. Um, uh, the, the sequence is called Thread, the book is called Thread. Um, and uh, numbers of the poems are, are addressed to people. Gustav, under earth by the tiny grave pits, Merovingian words we speak by the plague wall, by the house of the suicide, by the mount of winds, sits the low house of stone, lies the silk maker's house, thread spun and gone, words are the distant home. Thank you.